Hi there. I am absolutely terrified right now. Um, my stomach is uncomfortable. I have some goosebumps. Um, my palms are sweaty. I'm like an Eminem tune. The things that are going through my head right now are what if I screw up? This is being videoed. What if my screw ups are there forever? Um, why does my torso, why is it such that I can never find a shirt that quite fits? You know, extreme versions of these thoughts and feelings are what I've dealt with my entire adult life in the form of mental illness. The only reason I can stand here right now, trembling aside, is that I learned to meditate properly. A little bit about how I ended up here. In my teenage years, I started experiencing some bewildering symptoms. A lot of people have a difficult time in their teenage years, um, mostly emotionally. But usually for people, those emotions aren't crippling. For me, they were. And I was diagnosed with clinical depression and acute anxiety disorder. Thus began years of psychiatrists, psychologists, medications, um, essentially anything, to, up to and including moving to Alaska for a year to get some solitude. Um, I continued on that way, and things really turned in my second year of law school. I was engaged in what I can only call as a achievement addiction. If I could do the best research and get the best grades, work with the best professors, that would give me a little bit of a buzz, a little serotonin, a dopamine buzz, and it would hide my depression a little bit. At the end of my second year, I was named editor-in-chief of the Law Review, and it had been the greatest achievement in my life, and it felt great. But 24 hours later, reality set in again, and the depression was there, and I became dangerously suicidal for the second time in my life. And if it wasn't for an intervention by Professor John Nolan and a postdoc at the time, Mike Goonan, I wouldn't be here. So, I took a step back, and I reevaluated. Um, I reevaluated meditation. People noticed. They noticed I was better and in a sustained way, and over a period of years. And they began to, began to wonder why and how if I had tried everything else. And it was surprising to find that the reason was that I was spending literally weeks of my life on silent retreat, usually with a Tibetan Lama, and that was surprising for people who know me for a couple reasons. One, I'm a pretty outspoken atheist. My cats are even named after Christopher Hitchens and Carl Sagan. Second, thank you. Um, second, it's, it's a really bizarre thing to try to explain to someone how you can sit, meditate for 10 hours a day, no phones, no talking, no reading, no speaking. You don't even make eye contact in the hallways. How, is that, how could that possibly work? If anything, it's impossibly boring, right? So my talk today is an attempt to explain what I and many other people are doing when we get out and sit on silent retreat. Before we get into that, I want to talk about what depression is and what anxiety is. And because this is a metamorphosis um, talk, someone has to quote Kafka. And from the metamorphosis, Kafka says, I cannot make you understand. I cannot make anyone understand what is happening inside me. I can't even explain it to myself. That's so crucial to depression. You know that there is something desperately wrong, and you have no idea how to explain it. And in that way, you have no idea how to ask for help. As Andrew Solomon said in his brilliant TED Talk on depression, if sadness is roughly equivalent to the opposite of happiness, depression is roughly equivalent to the opposite of vitality. Depression is also not grief. Grief is explicitly reactive. Something happens, and you respond to it. Depression doesn't need a triggering event. Um, it's a, it feels like someone pulls a cork out of the bottom of your foot, and whatever vital forces you have just drains out. In my worst, I wouldn't be able to get out of bed for days. And when I would start to move, I would do things like crawl down the hallway, turn the shower on, and lay in the fetal position. And I wouldn't be able to get up. The warm water would run out, and I'd be laying there, shivering. 
That's depression. The corollary for a lot of people, and certainly me, is anxiety. And it feels like your fight or flight mechanism has gone haywire. When I was living in Alaska, I had an experience where I was fishing for salmon in a stream. And I went about 50 yards up, around a bend, and a huge black bear was there. Er, not black bear, brown bear. Um, it makes the black bears in Pennsylvania look rather tiny. And in that moment, I realized that in my backpack was my bear mace, and it was 50 yards away. Sheer terror. If the bear wanted to take me, it would have, and no one would have heard me scream. I was in the middle of nowhere. That's anxiety, except there's no bear there. There's it just terror, and it can last for weeks and months. Um, it can take the form of panic attacks, where you kind of you can't catch your breath, and and ultimately. You pass out usually, but you're no, and when you're going through it, you know that you're going to die. Of course you aren't, but subjectively you feel that you are. So let's pick up the tone a little bit, or the mood a little bit. The logic of meditation. Joseph Goldstein said, if you wish to understand your mind, sit down and watch it. It's worth repeating. If you wish to understand your mind, sit down and watch it. We spend most of our lives lost in thought. Whatever your mind is telling you right now, whether the story of who you are, your job title, um, what happened to you in the past, and most of the time you're doing that unconsciously. Meditation provides a mechanism by which you can study those thoughts and those emotions, much like a scientist go, conducts an experiment to find some truth about the objective world. You're in the same way conducting an experiment about your own subjectivity. Um, the more you practice, the clearer the mind becomes, and the more insight you're able to get. I like to think of it in two parts, awareness and the actual practice. Awareness isn't magical. There's nothing special about it. It's simply being aware, and not in a different way, being aware of more things. The practice of it, there's many different ways to do it, but you're essentially taking things like equanimity, patience, focus, love, empathy, and considering them skills that can be practiced just like a sport. This is my favorite teacher. I was fortunate enough to spend time with him, go on one of his silent retreats, Yangi Mingyur Rinpoche, and he says the Tibetan word for meditation, gom, means to become familiar with, familiar with how the mind works, how it creates and shapes our perceptions of ourselves and the world. I want to try something now to explain to you what awareness is. Just take a moment. I'll try to stop moving around. Notice what you know. Notice whatever it is, the stage, the speakers, the lights. Then notice what you notice internally. So maybe some pressure in your legs. Close your eyes. What are you thinking? Maybe you're thinking this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, or this is crazy. Maybe you're looking into the back of your eyes. Whatever it is, just let it arise. And notice it. OK, you could open your eyes now. That's, that's awareness, nothing magical about it. On the practice side of things, the three that helped me the most were Vipassana, Metta, and Dzogchen. Vipassana is sometimes called insight. Metta is um, loosely translated as loving kindness. Um, and Dzogchen is the toughest one to explain, but it has to do with nirvana and the, the illusion of the self. I'll briefly explain. Vipassana is like going to a gym for your mind. Um, as I said, if you consider focus and attention as skills, then you can practice them. And as my dad, who's here today, who was a great power lifter, showed me as a kid, the way to increase physical strength is repetitions. So if you have a dumbbell, gravity pulls it away, and you pull it back. And the more you do that, the stronger you get. In the exact same way, if you're trying to focus on something, anything, 
You could be staring at a wall. If you try to focus on it, your attention will be taken away, and you simply bring it back. That's a repetition. The more you do that, the greater your focus becomes. The key to this is that you do it non-judgmentally. If you can't do it, if it gets frustrating, and it will, you won't be able to do this. You say, OK, that's cool, that's fine. You just bring it back. And that's a little bit counterintuitive. If you're working with emotions, like anxiety or depression, and you, you want to innately push it away. And what I'm suggesting is that you sit with it and allow it to be and learn from it. How does this help Vipassana? The analogy that's often used is that your mind is like a monkey, and it's constantly grabbing, knocking things over. And the usual approach is to try to quiet the monkey down and train it somehow, but it's a wild animal. In Tibet, the idea is to simply allow it to be, become friends with it, get in touch with the consciousness behind it, and just watch it. Let it play, let it destroy things. It doesn't matter, because that's not what you are. You're not the monkey mind. It also allows for you to see emotions as emotions. I talked about the bear before, and if you actually study that feeling and compare it to something like a roller coaster, both situations, you're getting butterflies in your stomach. There's a sense of fear there. In one, it was the scariest moment of my life. In another, I'll wait in line over an hour and pay a ridiculous amount of money to st and stand out in 100-degree weather to go on this ride. Um, also, thoughts is thoughts. Um, whatever your ego is, it's, it's simply it's, it's stories that you've told yourself. It's misremembered memories, and it's projections into the future. And the more you practice Vipassana, the closer register you get to actually recognizing them as not what you are. They're just a story that you tell yourself. Metta is perhaps my favorite practice. Um, it's um, what Vipassana does. It does for emotions. Very simple practice with Metta is you just imagine someone that you love unconditionally. Very simple relationship. And you just say to yourself, may you be happy. May you be free from suffering. And you study how that feels. That intention, that very easy intention to help somebody out and to give them all the happiness in the world. Then you move on. You use that same feeling to, and apply it to a neutral person. And then you use that same feeling and you apply it to like a politician that you absolutely can't stand or someone who is really giving you a hard time at work. Someone that you didn't think was possible um, to feel that way about. And it deals with, um, as, you, as you practice this, certain emotions start to feel useless, like jealousy or envy. Like what is jealousy actually? Does it affect you in any way? It doesn't, right? You're still the same person. If someone gets a nice car, it doesn't do anything for you. You're exactly where you were. And as you practice metta, you stop, you, you're training your mind to essentially not respond reactively with jealousy. OK, the tough one, Dzogchen. It deals with the illusion of the self. And the best way I can explain it is I know I'm not this clicker right here. And why? A couple reasons, but one is that I'm subjectively observing it. There's a subject and there's an object. In a similar way, I could say the same thing about my hand. I'm looking at my hand. Whatever I'm calling I, I'm looking at it. Sure, it's part of my body, but when someone says, Steve, I don't, I don't think from the perspective of my hand. Progress with that and you figure out what you're calling I. When someone makes eye contact with you, that feeling, that sense of self, if you can, you, if you can examine that in the exact same way and find that it doesn't exist. And when the self drops away, the world comes in. You're only the consciousness behind, um, behind the sense of self. You're the observer is not what's riding around in your head. It usually feels like you're somewhere behind your eyes. One of my fears is coming true. I am running low on time. But let me tell you about what meditation is not. This is Thich Nhat Hanh. Some of you may be familiar with him. He's from the Theravada tradition, which I don't practice, but 
He's a wonderful teacher. I'm just going to read to you what he says. There is a misconception that Buddhism is a religion and that you worship Buddha. Buddhism is a practice like yoga. You can be a Christian and practice Buddhism. I met a Catholic priest who lives in a Buddhist monastery in France. He told me that Buddhism makes him a better Christian. I love that. So meditation gets all kinds of tangled up. I was raised Catholic, and I never would have approached it because that was a different religion. Meditation isn't, it's usually presented as Buddhist or Hindu, but it's not. It's just a practice like going to the gym. On the other side of it, for the non-religious, um, you're afraid for the opposite reason. Get that away from me. It has something to do with religion. And then as you start to read about this, just go to any New Age bookstore, and there's all kinds of things like you know, chakras, meridians, Atlantis, aliens, whatever. They're all associated in some loose way and unjustifiably with meditation. I just encourage you to keep an open mind here, and you don't need to take any of that. Meditation is just a practice by itself, completely separate. Um, I also wanted to address the two co most common misconceptions about meditation. I, I tried to meditate, but I can't calm my mind. You're not trying to do that. You're not trying to calm your mind at all. You're simply trying to watch essentially how crazy your mind is from an objective point of view. And I don't have time. This is my great, the great teacher Minga Rinpoche said, short time, many time, anywhere, anytime. You can meditate every time you wash your hands. You can meditate at the beginning of any meal. If you take just a moment and refocus, and for example, and taste your first bite fully, that's meditation. Because I'm almost at the end, I just want to leave you with my 30-second challenge. Take 30 seconds of your life anywhere. Get yourself nice and calm and see if you can stop thinking. I don't think you can. If you think you can, pay more attention. You're, you, you're either missing it or you're some sort of spiritual adept. If you can't control, your, if you can't stop thinking, if your life depended on it, in what sense are you really in control of things? Um, so thank you. I wish you all happiness, and I wish that you all be free from suffering, and thank you very much for your attention.